Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Eugene Peterson, and I'm chair of the Anne Arundel County Human Relations Commission. Uh, the commission is uh, mandated by charter and statute. It's in the charter. Um, and uh, we also ha are mandated by statute to uh, in look at uh, and investigate and uh, make any findings on alleged uh, housing discrimination. And we have a broader charge to uh, address uh, discrimination throughout Anne Arundel County, um, believing as the county executive and the county council have re reiterated many times that Anne Arundel County is the best place for all. And the way we can continue to make that a living reality is through the work that we do. Um, I, th I think I'm gonna ask, uh, uh, our secretary at this point in time, I don't think we have a, a enough. Uh, do we have enough uh, members present? And we're going to have some new commissioners, I believe, join us today. Um, do we have enough members present to uh, constitute constitute a uh, quorum? quorum? We we do we do have seven, including myself. Okay, so why don't we? Uh, Go ahead and move on to uh, the roll call. Would you uh, initiate the roll call, uh, Madam Secretary? Yes, I sure will. Thank you, um, Chairman Peterson. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, when I say your name, please acknowledge as saying here are present for attendance. Chairman Peterson. Present. Commissioner Gaskin. Present. Commissioner Goodman. Present. Commissioner Daydoni. Present. Commissioner uh, Tolson. Present. <laughs> uh, Lisa Cerro sitting in for Commissioner Karpowitz. Present. Um, I think we have some new ones that's coming in. Um, commission is Commissioner Ferris. Is is it a guest speaker or? One of our new commissioners. Commissioner, I'm present. Okay. <laughs> um, I would also like to acknowledge our special guest, um, Dr. Gillins. Um, also, I want to acknowledge HRL Smith and um, Chanel Clemens and Arundel TV. And I believe we have completed roll call and we do have enough for a quorum. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, I'd like to move to the first item on the agenda, which is uh, approval of the minutes from the May 18th meeting. Um, and um, <clears throat> of course, uh, our new commissioner, Commissioner Ferris, will not be voting on this because uh, he was not part of that meeting. But we do have a quorum so we can look at this. And I would ask the commission to uh, someone, a commissioner to put forth a motion to accept the uh, minutes with any minor technical corrections that would be required. I move that. I move for approval of the uh, minutes of the May meeting with any necessary corrections. Okay. Uh, just a minute. This is Commissioner Dedoni. I yes. second the motion. Okay. It's been properly moved and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Hello, can um, anybody hear me perchance? This is David Michaels. A new... Oh, David. Yes. Welcome, Commissioner Michaels. Yes. Can you see me and hear me? Because, uh, yeah, I don't know what's. Uh, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Your um, camera is looks like it's off. He was just promoted to panelist. Oh, okay. And, and can you compare? There you are. There we are. And can you pro co promote Commissioner uh, Ferris as a two? Yes, I, I will also acknowledge commis Commissioner uh, David. Is it David or Davis? You're on mute. You're on mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. It's, it's Commissioner David Michaels, right? 
David correct. Michaels? That's yes. correct. Okay. I'm, there's, I'm, I'm at work. Okay, thank you for joining <laughs> us. And there's uh, Commissioner Jaden Ferris. Okay. Okay, we got everybody. Fantastic. Um, now that we've moved from the approval of the minutes, um, I'm hoping that uh, we were scheduled to have um, uh, Nancy Drew, the uh, office manager for the church in Glen Burnie, to come and give us uh, a presentation on uh, what happened to that church and why it's important for us to understand the implications of the uh, hate bias vandalism that occurred there. Um, Chanel, we, we don't have uh, Ms. Drew yet, do we? No, we do not. We have uh, Erica McFarlane. Erica, McFar Erica McFarlane? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why don't um, we... Yeah, that's, I'm, not, I'm not presenting, though. I'm just from the Coalition for RTPG Plus Students. Okay. Um... So, Ms. Ellicott, can you state where again you, you're from for notes, note purpose? Sure. Did you say um, Abby Ellicott? Yes. Yeah, yeah I am a um, Savannah Park resident and I represent the Coalition for LGBTQ plus students along with Erica McFarland. And Asha Smith invited us to attend and observe. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, as soon as uh, uh, Ms. Drew joins us, we will uh, welcome her and uh, start with her presentation. But I think it would be okay if, if everybody would agree for me to move to the next agenda item which is uh, Dr. Gillens. Uh, welcome, Dr. Gillens, once again. Chairman uh, Peterson, before we move, can yes. I just acknowledge Erica uh, McFarland yes. and um, to also uh, get a, a little more of who, the, who this person is? And okay. Um, yeah, so I'm part of the uh, Coalition for LGBTQ Plus Students with Abby. Um, and I'm also... Um, on the CAC um, Hate and Bias Committee um, for Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Gillens is with us and we've asked Dr. Gillens um, and this will be followed by in next month, uh, a uh, presentation by the Anne Arundel County Police Department uh, on hate bias incidents and the police department will give us, and, and hate bias symbols, and they will give us a detailed uh, presentation on uh, those uh, issues, how they deal with them, and uh, what implications it has for Anne Arundel County. But we've asked Dr. Gillens to come uh, and give us uh, a presentation on how hate bias incidents are addressed, uh, their presence in Anne Arundel County Public Schools and how they're addressed. Okay, uh, so we'll turn now to uh, Dr. Gillens. Let me get her up here. Hey, Dr. Gillens, you're you're muted. Uh oh. Oh, and we. We also have uh, another commissioner, uh, Commissioner Denton has joined us too. So that's our three new commissioners all here. That's, that's good. And um, I'm looking for, oh, here's Dr. Gillens. Okay, great. Dr. Gillens, can you, are you audible now? Can't hear you. Nothing. Okay, she's trying to sort herself out there. It's okay.
Do you want to go out and come back in? Oh, she says she's going to call in from her phone. Um, I am not able to see Abby Ellicott is still being with us on the participants uh, tab. It shows that she's still here with her hand raised. So trying to be a good neighbor. Is she still with us? Yeah, Abby Ellicott is still here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. In the meanwhile, Dr. Gillens is just sending me um, a request for something here. So I am sending it to her. <laughs> okay. Well, this Thank is you. the power of the tech, right? Yep. Dr. Gillens, we were able to um, pull up the hate bias document that you put in the chat. I think she's gotten what she needs. Did you get it, Dr. Gillens? Okay, awesome. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm echo so I'm gonna echo. I'm gonna end here. All righty. So here are all the fun things, fun facts, y'all. So again, I am Maisha Gillens, the Executive Director for Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement. 
Trust me, I was on a Teams call easily an hour ago. I have no idea why my computer did not like Zoom. I do Zoom all the time. And um, Jaden, he's an intern in my office. So he's like, use your earbuds, doc. And I'm like, my earbuds aren't attached to my laptop. My earbuds are attached to my phone. So I'm not quite sure what happened. And so now what's going to be lovely is since I am calling from my phone, I now do not have access to the chat box from my computer. But this is all fun. And I have tons of friends on this call. So here are the people I'm going to call on right now. I'm going to tag you. So open up your email. I may need for you to begin dropping links in the chat for me. I'm calling you out. Faye, I know you. You're my friend. You'll help me out. Asha, I know you. You're my friend. You will help me out. Dr. Dodoni, no, I'm not going to leave you out of this. And of course, Jaden. So between them, if you're on your email and I start forwarding you links, please uh, help me out by placing the links in the chat box. So the first link I place in the chat box, and again, this really for me it's uh, not really a presentation of a slide deck. It really is to equip you with where to find the language to answer the questions that you have about how bias and bullying is dealt with in Anne Arundel County Public Schools, fair enough. So when you leave here, instead of me ending the call, you no longer have access to the slide deck. You're like, what in the world did she say? I'm at least leaving you with those tools that you can refer back to. And so let me open the document here just to refresh my memory as to which, what document I did uh, provide you. And I believe it was the regulation, right? The bias behavior and lang language regulation. Why this is important. So we have a policy. And as you know, the school board, they are the ones that adopt a, the policy. The regs tells the school system folks how to implement the policy. So it shouldn't really be a mystery as to how we deal with things because it's it's in written, it's in written form. And so if you check out that regulation, so hopefully everyone has had an opportunity to pull up the regulation. If you keep moving down, well, definitely the regulation gives you some definition, right? We talk about uh, level setting terms. It talks about how to define age bias, homeless, homelessness, uh, religious bias, et cetera. But if you keep going down, there's this thing called procedures, right? What, what's supposed to happen? If an incident happens of bias, behavior, and language, then what happens next? So take a moment just to read through what it says about reporting, right? How our uh, bias behavior and uh, incidents should be reported. And it talks about what is the school's responsibility in reporting, so again, I'm going to give you a moment just to read through that part of the regulations that speak to reporting, the reporting process. And for just for clarification, you also see in information here, it talks about, for instance, letter D. It mentions bullying, harassment, and intimidation form. That form is public facing. So that form you would see in the student code of conduct, the student handbook, that form are links on a student Brightspace page. The Brightspace is a student's learning management system. So a student can, re can report uh, anything around bias, behavior, bullying, harassment, intimidation. It's all combined in uh, one reporting form. Parents have access to this form online. So definitely there are different access points to file a complaint, again, whether it's bullying, harassment, intimidation, or bias behavior. So again, you have these touch points, and this is the form that this would happen. That's the name of the form. So now let's scoot on. First of all, are there questions regarding reporting? So if an incident happens, who can report anybody and everyone, right? The student can report it, a bystander can report it, a student can tell a teacher, or staff member, this is happening to me, right? And then that can be reported that way. An administrator can fill out the form. Again, a parent or a guardian can fill out that form. And I know I, I heard uh, on the call when um, individuals were introducing themselves, there's a high representation this evening from the Coalition of LGBTQ+. So as advocacy groups, 
right? It's also important to know, hey, a student from AACP has shared this with me. I, as an advocate, can go in there and file a complaint. Dr. Dodona, I see you've unmuted. Oh, you know me so well. Um, some of us were at um, a NAACP conference last night um, where we discussed the complaints procedure and full disclosure. I had an opportunity in the day to discuss the complaint appeal procedure with Dr. Gellens and Mrs. Jackson. Um, mm -hmm. I um, am attuned to who can make the, these reports. Um, and as I reread the regulation, it said the student can make the report, but the faculty will or staff person will help them do it. Mm -hmm. You've said that anyone can do the report, the student, the parent, mm -hmm. the the faculty member, my memory is telling me that faculty members or staff members who witness bullying, um, intimidation, bias language are required to report it. Have I forgotten it? Have I gotten this wrong? Is there not a, a requirement to report? So that you, these are really good questions. So the language where we say requirement typically has to do with um, harm, like abuse, child abuse. Like we're mandatory, you'll hear that language being a mandatory reporter when it has to do with some type of abuse. Now, of course, if a staff member witnesses something, yes, we're saying you have to report. What we do find in the school system, unfortunately, a lot of times staff members don't know the student. So let's say you have a hallway full of kids and you hear some language in there that's not acceptable language being used. A lot of times, what I've heard from staff members is that it's happened so quickly, they're already down the hallway. Now it's difficult for me to do the reporting. However, of course, it's good to go to a colleague, you get a description of the child. They were wearing a green shirt with such and such written on their shirt. So you have to uh, you know, pursue it more or get more information to really identify. So really the language of this mandatory reporting, uh, as far as Comar is concerned, is for child abuse. If there's any, you know, inclination that a child has is been abused, we are mandatory reporters. So I don't know if when you heard that language, mandatory reporting, that's the, that's the in, in which we speak about mandatory reporting when it comes to child abuse. Uh, right. Thank you. So it is not a violation of either policy or regulation for a staff member to ignore an incident of bu bullying, biased behavior, um, language, unless unless the student comes to them for assistance. Is that correct? It doesn't have to be unless. No, definitely a staff member can report it for sure. Yes. But the language of uh, must or like I say, Comar, you know, we're, we're obviously yeah. driven by Comar. So there's no Comar language. Comar, just for everyone listening, would be what the state sets expectations for a uh, school district. So there's no language in Comar that says that. Of course, the school district is like, if you see something, say something, that is your professional responsibility to report things. But that's your biased behavior. Mm -hmm. Where is that codified? The requirement to report if you see say see something say something um i will have to look to see where i think it's a common practice that it's a it's your job responsibility that we I mean, we don't and our philosophy isn't ignore things that are happening around you i will have to look at the rating form i will have to look at the teaching and learning form but we yeah. don't you know employ people to be oblivious to what's happening around them so it is a professional expectation. But I understand what you're saying um, here. I'll have to see if there's actual tangible language or a lot of things that are unwritten where it is an expectation. Like you are expected to not show up to work, for instance, cursing children out. We don't have that written anywhere. I'm just saying it's not like you're not going to find on page three, it says don't curse children out, but that is an expectation of, of professional judgment of what not to do. Um, um, thank you. And I apologize because I realize after all these years of working together, you know, I can become aggressive in here. I've done it in public. And no, you like, are fine. You're fine. You're fine. Um, I'm, 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 thank you. I apologize for the tone of my uh, questions. You've answered my question. And okay. I, I certainly accept that as a reasonable answer. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like Erica is, um, has her hand up as well. 
Um, yes, I the chat's disabled for me. Am I able to have access to that? Oh no. Oh, because you're in webinar, is that why? I guess so, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure, I'm not- so the, Unless um, you're a host oh, or ahead. a panelist, you won't have access to the chat. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, but however, Erica, what I am reading to you, this is accessible on the AACPS website under the Board of Ed. It is the Bias Behavior and Language Regulations. So if you Great. literally go on the AACPS website and put bias and behavior language regulation, it will come up for you. Great. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. And Erica, I'm about to email it to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you Mary, so do much. Do you want to hold on to those emails? Dr. Dodoni, I already did. Oh, okay. Look at that. Y'all are on you, it. Jim. I know that's You've right. you all got me. See? Thank you. <laughs> Aren't they great? So now let's scoot on down to investigation. Dr. Gillens, right? can I ask a quick question? I'm oh. sorry, I, I don't have the icon to put my hand up. Sure. Um, in regards to reporting, I see mm -hmm. the regulations that state how a student or um, faculty or whoever can report. Um, what about the school or if it's been reported, making sure that the, the parents of the victim has also been notified? Yeah, that's part of the process. So it should come in here down when we talk about investigation. Okay. Um, as far, here we go. If you look at letter D, parent guardian of alleged victim shall be notified as soon as practic practicable. So we scoot on down under investigation. And if you look at letter D, do you see that there in letter D under investigation? Okay. Well, I don't necessarily have a letter D. Oh, okay. All righty. So do you see something? I have like the Roman bold? numerals. Mm, and you're looking in the regulations or the policy? I'm looking at number two, investigation. So it starts with yes. A. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I'm missing page four. That's why. I found okay. it. I have it now. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And so again, if we can take a moment just to read through that investigation piece, even with this whole you know idea about um, the notification, right? It says within two school days, so schools shouldn't be sitting on things. It should be responded to within two school days. So that's something even to note. We know that sometimes schools get very busy, inundated with a whole lot of stuff. But again, and of course it says whenever practicable, you know, something obviously happens, you know, there's a trash can fire, you know, school needs to be evacuated. But in most cases, there is a, a timeline in which uh, things should be, uh, family should, it should be dealt with and notified. I think this is Abby, is that Abby? I see a hand up and I'm yes, assuming that's Abby. That. Okay. <laughs> yes, I just wanted Jaden to email me the same information because I can't see the chat either. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. So again, if we keep moving down around the investigation part of the um, regulations, so this is an interesting one, letter H. Some acts of beha biased behavior in language may be considered criminal under federal and state law and ca characterized as a hate crime. Any biased behavior in language that appears to be a hate crime shall be promptly reported to law enforcement. So mm -hmm. AACPS, we don't determine whether or not it's a hate crime. And it's really interesting that the threshold for identifying hate crime, and I'm sure you all know a lot of things that have happened in our own backyard where it's been real difficult for whatever the incident is to rise to a hate crime. So that's something to know. And obviously that is the law enforcement police. They're the ones who uh, make that determination. And so even when the conversation about hate bias, that's not the language we use. We use bias, behavior, and language. So that's something to note as well. Bias, behavior, and language. Hate 
crime that is deemed by law enforcement or determined by. And again, there's a threshold that is involved to that. Asha. Dr. Gillens, I was just going to ask you if it would help you if I shared my screen with the policy up as you go through it or the reg up. Is yeah, I am think those folks who don't have the, um, what's the word, access to the chat, that would be great. Thank you. And so I we're on the regs now under due process. And so due process is definitely important as well as you um, you can imagine um, the, the the what due process means just in case folks don't understand what due process means everyone all parties involved in a situation they have a right for a clean and clear investigation right so the person who allegedly did it um, did the the bias behavior act, and obviously the individual who was on the receiving end. Both parties have a right, based on due process, to be investigated, interviewed, questioned. So the administrator, right, can be very clear as to what happened and to collect that information. So I know that sometimes it can be frustrating, right? There may be multiple witnesses and having to collect this information, but just to make everyone be very clear on this notion of due process, and I'm sure we can appreciate uh, that due process is necessary. Everyone has the right, again, to be able to uh, provide evidence uh, as to what happened so the school can make an informed decision. And so part of the due process process is not only the investigation, but also letting um, fam the, the person who did the incident, right, the, the aggressor or the person who made that bias uh, comment, et cetera, that they then are part of due process is told what the consequence is gonna be. Now, this is what um, is important to know. Oftentimes the victim in the situation, right, the individual which who was on the receiving end of the incident, it's very frustrating because the school, I can't, so let's, I'm going to, I'm going to, let's, let's do this. So Asha says something to Maisha that is bias motivated. The investigation happens. The administrator says, Asha, you are going to be suspended based on the evidence we found. You can't let Maisha or Maisha's family know because Asha, while Asha is at home suspended <laughs> and getting her consequences. She still has rights to privacy. Does that make sense? She still has rights to privacy. That is a very frustrating thing for families. And I understand why. It's like, well, wait a minute. Maisha is over here, the victim. You know, Asha said all these terrible things and you can't even tell me what's going to happen to Asha. And the answer is no. Now, what the administrator can say is we follow the code of conduct, the handbook, right? And the code of conduct does give you, obviously, a list of things that could possibly happen. But that is something that is very, very frustrating because of privacy um, rules that you cannot disclose to another family, whether it's academics, whether it's discipline in nature, anything, because we have privacy rights. So I'm gonna pause there for a minute because I know that is a point of, of frustration a lot of times. Dr. Tadoni, did you have something? Yes, thank you. I just mm -hmm. want to acknowledge this tremendous point of frustration. I'm not mm -hmm. saying this doesn't work. I am saying that it is not transparent and the discussion I've had with you and others, Dr. Gillens, is that when we think of justice, mm -hmm. we think of being able to see the consequences. And I use the horrific example of the shooter at the Capitol Gazette. And mm -hmm. people were out in front of the courthouse, including the district attorney, the state's attorney for uh, Anne Arundel County, um, mm -hmm. acknowledging the value of seeing the consequences. I'm in a position where I occasionally hear from parents who were saying, well, we saw the consequences and he was back in school amongst the other students two mm -hmm. days later. Mm -hmm. And my daughter or son is still dreadfully upset and afraid. Mm -hmm. So I want to say for all of us, it may be justice. It doesn't look like our common, our, our, our concept of what justice will look like. Yeah. 
not transparent. And at the same time, you are protecting those who need to be protected. Yeah. And you have to also think we are also, so thank you for that example, um, Dr. Dodoni. Um, but we're also working with children. So we have to always, we have to remember that. <laughs> so the example you gave was a grown person, right? So after you're 21, you, you do a crime, listen, hey, <laughs> you, it's all, you know, privacy is off limits at this point, right? And so from the uh, pre-K through 12 perspective, there is still protection, right, for young people, you know? Um, what I also, when I used to be a, a principal, when I would uh, work with the families in which this thing happened to them, I would always say, we got to keep the, the line of communication open, right? If the student continues with this behavior, you have to let me know because then there are other progressive discipline, you know, items that can certainly happen. So that line of communication is really, really important. Definitely it's my job also to check in with the student, right? How are things going? Are things getting better? Are there things in which you can create a safety plan, right, to make sure that class changes are happening, the teachers are notified, um, we're not going to go down the same hall, I may change lunch. So a lot of other things can occur to ensure that or just to try to provide some structures so an incident wouldn't happen again, especially to your point, Dr. Dodoni, if it's something in which the student does come back to the school building. Because if you look at our student code of conduct, students do return to, to their school building. It depends on what the situation is, of course, right? It depends on what the infraction is. Yeah. And while I'm saying all this, I'm equally aware that we have to protect students' educational rights and continuance of education while they're being disciplined. And I believe we are, most of us, committed to a restorative mm -hmm practices as opposed to strictly punitive practices. So I'm Correct. acknowledging the complexity of it and reflecting it in my comments. Uh, Dr. Gillens, um, could you comment on whether or not, as, since we're having this discussion of the uh, uh, complete transparency, um, is it the school district's position that there's a, and I don't know whether it's in the reg or not, that there's a progressive disciplinary uh, tree that's followed by principals and vice principals, et cetera, when these kind of instances occur? Dr. Gillens, you're muted, dear. Oops, sorry, I'm muting myself. Um, so thank you for the question, Mr. Peterson. And it's, it's, it's tricky how to answer that. So yes, we believe in progressive discipline. However, so let's say I have classroom disruption, right? So I'm that child, and you can probably imagine that with me, right? I'm the child who likes to talk all the time. I'm talking to my friends. I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking. And I may get warnings. So the progressive discipline will be warning, a detention, right? Maisha still is still chatty. Clearly, you know, this, these gradual discipline disciplinary actions isn't working so we now need to up it up now if a student comes to school to fight you know and fight we're not going to do a warning right so we've kind of skipped over some steps depending on the situation if a st student brings in a weapon we're not doing progressive discipline right because we have to keep our schools safe so yes there is progressive discipline depending on what the um infraction is and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to Attempt to, oh, look at that. See, you see how they got my back. Thank you, Jaden. Is that the student handbook? Yep. See, listen, I just, y'all, mm -mm -mm, I just appreciate you all. So that's, so if you look in the student handbook and if you keep going down to the pages where it have like little dots on it, it talks about level one, level two, that's where it will give you an idea as to here's the infraction. And then here are the consequences that could go along with it. And again, with some progression. And if it's egregious, then of course we're not, um, we're beyond, you know, a warning or a detention. You know, it really requires some days out of school, et cetera. So thank you for that question. Did I, I hope I answered that, Mr. Peterson, this notion of progressive discipline. Uh, yes. And one other uh, area of concern I think that we all might have is um, it, safe and secure schools. You're the, uh, um, 
equity and accelerated achievement group. How does this all work so that complaints, alleged uh, complaints don't get siloed? Yeah, a lot of things are, are so I'm central office based, right? And we have a structure in our school system where the principals have regionals and they have supervisors, right? They have regional assistant superintendents and they also have uh, directors of school performance. And so to your point, if things are happening at a school, the data is showing there's a spike, et cetera, the first point of contact is the supervisor for that school or the director of school performance. If it gets to a point in which it's bias related, um, definitely I get called in to do some cons consultating, do walkthroughs, work with staff, et cetera. So the first line is that supervisor. And so just again, to reiterate our structure, we actually meet weekly. So I'm a part of the superintendent's executive team and the supervisors for principals, again, they're called regional assistant superintendents. We share that same space once a week. So we're in this constant communication around what's going on with your schools. But that first point of contact is not my office. That first point of contact is the supervisor for the principal, which is the regional assistant superintendent. Yeah. Yes. Lakeisha. So um, speaking towards the consequence, and I see the different levels here. Um, mm -hmm. What it, what can you walk us through how it looks for a person um, that may be a repeat offender that might yeah. necessarily not just have one particular person, but multiple. Like, you know, I, I know that there's probably only but so much you can do with suspensions and things of that nature. But I see that some of the prevention might be, um, you know, uh, you you having some discussions, some, some collaborations. But can you walk us through when you do have that one or that's that one student that may be a repeat offender? Yeah. Of bias sure. actions. Yeah, definitely, for sure. So first, um, I don't know if we mentioned this, but this is in the regulations as well. When it, it There's language in there about consequences. And one of the things, if a uh, one of the consequences for a first offense for biased behavior and language is a class. So students are referred to a class. It's the Bias Motivated Behavior Program. So that's something to know. We have we have a, a programs like that for students who bring cigarettes or alcohol to school uh, for fighting. That's a responsible action program. So not only would, again, could be exclusion from school, which would be a suspension, also attending this class. In addition to that, there are options for community um, conferencing. So let's say this is a huge issue in which this conflict is continuing. Um, but I'm with you. If the con if the student continues the same behavior and clearly all the other consequences aren't working, we do have alternative schools in our school district. And so the names of our alternative schools is uh, Mary Moss at J. Albert Adams. That school is located in Annapolis. And we also have a school, in, uh, again, our, it's considered an alternative school called Phoenix Academy that's also located in Annapolis. Now, most of the students who attend that school typically have um, some special education needs uh, identified as emotional uh, disturbed. That is ED. That's the um, acronym for that. And then we also have the evening high school program, right? So for some students, for a variety of reasons, the comprehensive day school environment may not be the best fit. Again, variety of reasons, whether it's a work schedule, I have other obligations, or whether to your point, I'm a repeat offender and things aren't just working out for me. Therefore, and then we also have, um, um, there are some situations in which students have to go on an emergency home and hospital teaching, right? Which is that adult, now that's definitely rare cases, when that happens, there's usually some kind of medical situation, et cetera. But we definitely have these different 
um, situation. We have virtual academy. Now, again, to get in virtual academy is very limited, but however, um, if there is a situation that's very unique that uh, the other environments just aren't working, we do have a virtual academy that exists. But again, the purpose of it isn't, you know, it's not considered really an alternative placement where the other locations, their programming is different. Um, where virtual academy is a comprehensive setting, you know, but it's virtual, which is at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hopefully I've answered that. So in Thank the regulations, you, it did. You're it did. Thank you. And so in the regulations, if you go past consequences, we obviously want to go into preventive mode, right? Y'all like we want to prevent all of this from happening in the first place. So here's the part where I'm going to ask for your help and support when it comes to prevention. That's number five. And then there's intervention and supports, right, that we have. And one of the things that was asked ahead of time had to do with what happens with the individual that was on the receiving end, you know, of this. And of course we wrap our arms around, uh, at least that's what we're supposed to do is wrap our arms around students. So let's talk about this prevention piece. And this is the piece I'm gonna ask for your help and your support with. So it is our goal to work with students around how do we treat one another, right? So I'm gonna give you an example of one of the efforts we're trying to do school-wide, at least out of my office, because I can speak to the work that I do out of my office. We have four early dismissal days that are designated for uh, equity professional learning for adults. So four days a year, students go home early, staff, school-based staff and central office folks, they go to a school and they engage in three hours of professional learning, okay? But that's not the point of what I'm saying about prevention. In that week, we call them unity days. We call them unity days. Teachers then get provided lessons that they can teach to students around creating bias, bullying, free environment. We call it unity day. Here's the feedback we get. We get language like Unity Day is nothing but grooming children. Okay. That's what you're doing, right? And so what I need help from and support from the community is that no, we're 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 working on number five of this regulation. That's what we're doing. We're helping not only obviously staff, but we're trying to help students and how to treat each other with dignity and respect across differences. That is what we're doing. That's the challenge. That's the pushback we get. Uh, yes, Mr. Peterson. Dr. Gillens, I don't expect you to uh give us this information now, but it would be helpful to know if there are areas of concern that the school district has. In other words, you're asking us to help, but where would the targeted help in uh, our, I won't call it intervention, I'll say help, would be most beneficial? Um, and we could probably... Uh, address that uh, similarly to the way in which we get information from the uh, public school uh, uh, police department. Mm -hmm. um, they give us maps that show us where the highest okay. incidence of certain kind of uh, bias behavior incidents mm -hmm. occur. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you have any uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, I definitely have to process that. I know for, because that was another question that was asked as far as where is our data housed. So I am going to email that right now as to where our data is housed, but I'm pretty sure we did not do it by cluster. So Mr. Peterson, I'm really going to have to think about that because while, because again, we're still working with children, right? And <laughs> That's always very, you know, very sensitive to, I don't know the word, target children. 
because there are children behind these things. So yeah. I'm going to have to think through that one. Yeah, I'm, yeah, not, as I'm, I'm not suggesting we target um, children, but mm -hmm. last year we specifically had that uh, unity tree lighting yes. in an area that was brought to our attention. So mm -hmm. the question is if we were, and we will we'll be discussing at a future meeting doing another unity tree lighting this year mm -hmm. where would that be of the most help and mm -hmm. and if we do outreach you know we would do outreach to uh, the religious community we mm -hmm. do outreach to the uh, uh business community we do outreach to any uh uh folks who you work with in the school system and see if we can't get a better uh, mm -hmm. well, our initial one uh, one was fine but have a better um uh outreach effort this time around mm -hmm. well i'm assuming you're keeping me on that planning committee that's number one is that a safe assumption mr peter that is correct <laughs> so we can definitely work through the data piece okay <laughs> we could definitely work through that data piece so what i have uh, emailed out which that email i know will make its way to the chat is where is some of this data housed as far as public facing? How would the community know where AACPS is? So I'm going to open it up so I can see for myself, so I can kind of talk through it. And so the, the link that I gave you should take you to the page of for the Board of Education. These are the school board members. And so I would say maybe four years ago, actually it was from our former school board member, Ms. Antoine. She really was passionate about us bringing forth information to the school board at this at day, I think it was day meetings or maybe it was evening meetings. I can't remember, at school board meetings once a month. And so that has stopped, however, we still uh, in, we still do provide information. So if you look on the site, on the left, it says monthly reports, monthly board reports. And I think it's up because it's really teeny tiny. Is that up, y'all? Is that what that's what you're showing, Oscar? Yes, thank you. And so you see here has bullying and bias, security, diversity, and inclusion, and transportation. And so if we were to click on bullying and bias, let's see how we have that listed. It um, has information on here. It says who it's being submitted by. So you can see the office that this is going under. It talks about a bullying prevention work group. Student services has some updates here. And then it looks like on page two, it has some data here by school level, not by cluster or by school. So this is the bullying and then bias motivated. These are bullying and bias motivated are two different things. So by uh, bullying is typically something that occurs consistently over time where bias, you just have to say something to me once, right? Um, for it to be deemed a biased uh, incident. And so let me keep looking at some of the questions. Are there questions here? I think one of the questions, and do we host or support tabletop participation at county or city fairs or programs representing and supporting anti-bullying campaign? Are we talking to Human Relations Commission doing this? Who submitted the question? Could you clarify? Yeah, there you go. I had to unmute. Uh, David Michaels. Uh, yes, so there are like various uh, in the county, Anne Arundel County, also in the city of Annapolis, where, for example, at Pride Fair, they have tables from county organizations and groups um, that are, you know, offering uh, pamphlets or programs to help support families, whether it's housing or in this case, uh, LGBTQ rights 
or, you know, banks, realtors, you know, these kinds of things. Is, is it appropriate to have an anti-bullying kind of table where the Human Relations Commission, um, because it's my understanding this is some of the work we, we do as far as supporting uh, these kinds of efforts, do we, do you need our help anyway in outreach? Well, I definitely think the more information we can put out there, the better, for sure. And this is why these type of meetings are important. So you can see, kind of hear our procedures. And, you know, to your point, even when I talked about the Unity Day lessons, right. the purpose of me saying that is I need for you all to say, no, they're not indoctrinating children. They are trying to create spaces of belonging for all kids, right? So I need that back, right? I need... I need for you all to say that back. So no, yeah, I definitely think that is amazing. I'm just trying to think, um, you know, to your point, you used the pride parade as an example where you had a, you had a lot of people out there, right? So yeah. your touch point. And so we got to think about, you know, where are these uh, touch points? Where are um, opportunities where people are there? And like you said, a table set up, here's some information to, to distribute. So I think that's a really great idea. I'm actually going to put in the, I'm going to email um, um, you know, our, your colleagues, our colleagues, some more information, kind of like flyers. You know, the regs are one thing. I don't know if anybody wants to like, you know, pass out a bunch of regulations because it's a lot yeah. of stuff. But I do have some like flyers, some, some pamphlet type of information. I'm going to go ahead and forward that over as well. That may help with that, you know, quick, sure. let me educate you. Here's what's happening in an easily digestible way. So I'm going to um, attempt to do that thinking. now. Yeah, I was just thinking how there's been anti-bullying campaigns globally and in the U.S. Oh, yeah. and, yep. and I'm wondering if this is just a, are you aware that these regulations uh, exist, you know, again, in the pamphlet format, safe spaces at schools, that there are education for teachers, faculty, students, community, that this exists that there is support from the uh, police department and or even fire department, uh, you know, mm -hmm. areas, even the medical di divisions mm -hmm. uh, to have this conversation. I'm mm -hmm. being the new guy on the block here. I don't know exactly how much we participate or this is just a listening commission, you know, where we listen to all of these things and, like uh, the uh, chairman said, you know, we have a unity day. I'm just thinking, is that enough? Do we do more? That's all. Uh, points well taken, uh, Commissioner. And um, something that we as a commission should discuss internally and then uh, find uh, ways to do this. I know you, you talked about the, the Pride Day efforts. Um, there's also a, a historic uh, uh, community event in Glen Burnie that happens each year. Uh, I think they have a fair there. Um, right. There are other fairs around the county. So if we were to become more active um, and maybe uh, team up with the school district, uh, mm -hmm. uh, would it be a, a, mm -hmm. a, a good idea to try to, you know, get tables at these events and uh, have literature and information and a person there to say, you know, this is what we're promoting. We're promoting unity. Uh, this mm -hmm. isn't about grooming kids. It's not about uh, uh, pushing uh, 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 critical race theory. It's not about any of those things. It's about getting people to follow what Rodney King once said. Why can't we just all get along? All right. So um, yeah, um, we we will definitely, uh, as a commission, um, uh, look look at that, especially when we have our discussion about uh, Unity Day uh, this year and what we might do with that mm -hmm. and other efforts forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and it looks like Dr. Dodoni did place uh, some links in the chat, and these are by brochures as a, again, resource for you. 
So I'm right at seven o'clock and my marching orders were, Maisha, you will have about 15 to 30 minutes. I'm now at an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> I am going to <laughs> end now. I, I Hopefully I've provided tons of resources for you. I'm sure that we'll be in uh, constant communication uh, in the future to see, you know, what other type of partnerships or conversations we'll have. But thank you. I appreciate the um, invitation. We still have lots of work to do. You know that. And uh, I'm here for it. And I know you're here for it because you wouldn't be on this call tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gillins. Um, Chanel, have we have we heard from uh, Ms. Drew yet? I believe she's... Um... In attendance. I oh, can good. promote her if you like. Yes. Okay. Why don't we promote uh, Ms. Drew? And she can... Okay, we have uh, uh, Nancy Drew. Um, Nancy, um, apologize for uh, not uh, bringing you on at the time. Uh, the meeting started, but uh, uh, we're trying to work through uh, our agenda here. So um, could you uh, uh, go ahead and as the, uh, I'm hoping I identified the uh, church, right? Office manager of the Good Shepherd Church in Glen Burnie. And talk to us about the impact of the hate, bias, vandalism, incidents on the church and the community from uh uh, your perspective and the church community's perspective. Did you, can you turn on your camera and unmute yourself so we can? Can you hear me now? Yes. I don't know if you can see me. I apologize. I brought my work computer, which does not have a camera, so I jumped on my no, phone. It's fine. We, <laughs> we hear you loud and clear. Okay, perfectly. So I am uh, the office manager for Christ the King Catholic Church, Good Shepherd Church, which has been repeatedly vandalized um, since January of this year and even uh, last year um, is under our umbrella. We've consolidated three Catholic churches in the Glen Burnie area, Church of the Good Shepherd, Church of the Crucifixion on Scott Avenue, which has been sold, and Holy Trinity Church, which is the oldest. We're over 100 years old on B&A Boulevard. The churches obviously had to consolidate due to the low attendance and the um, cost of keeping three facilities open. We closed Good Shepherd Campus on Furnace Avenue in 2017. We reused the facility during the pandemic. And then we finally really closed the doors in 2019. Um, this year, we've experienced a lot of vandalism. Last year, uh, vandals broke in and cut all the copper wires out of the building and took our air conditioning units. The building was under contract to be sold in the end of 2019 to a developer. The contingency to sell the land was that they would get through the permit process to build, which is a normal standard in purchasing um, commercial property. So we were responsible for the property, even though it was under contract to be sold. When the pandemic hit, it delayed that process to three years instead of the two. We cannot maintain a presence in there because we couldn't afford to keep it open. So we have a maintenance guy that goes in. After uh, January, they started breaking windows. We thought initially it was teenagers in the area because they really weren't doing anything destructive, but we emptied out everything in the building that was sacred and sacramental to us. The main altar um, does not have any um, um, relics in it. So it has been decommissioned, for lack of a better word, although it is still a sacred space to us. In April, vandals came in and they started really breaking the windows on a repeated basis. In on the county would respond, but we haven't been able to capture uh, catch, catch these people. 
after they broke windows when we boarded some up, they smashed the glass, the two main glass doors to the building and entered it. And we boarded those up. And then after that, they gained entry again, set off a fire extinguisher with the CO2 and wrote the most vulgar things on our altar. That was our altar. Um, racial slurs, sexual slurs, slurs against homosexuals. Um, it was vulgar to see, shocking. And at that time, we really decided that this was going to be a hate crime. Um, no one was physically injured. And very few people in our community saw the damage that was done inside the church because it's been boarded up. At that point, we boarded up all of the building. And the following week, they desecrated the outside of the building by spray painting, again, vulgar images, vulgar words, um, uh, racial slurs. And we have painted those over. We're dedicated to representing ourselves as a church. And um, we care about the community that our church was built into. However, we don't have the resources. And we know that the Enrollment County Police Department does not have the resources to watch this church that's really tucked back in a community on a regular basis to catch these. So we're an abandoned building, more or less. I mean, unfortunately, it's an abandoned church that sits on waterfront property that has a community on one side and then apartments on the other. Um, and it faces a school. I believe it faces um, Marley Elementary School, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you have school children that are, fortunately, the front of the building, even though it's boarded up, has not been desecrated, but it's impacting the community in a very negative way. And the more people in our church community that come to find out about it are frustrated and angry that that our name is still associated with it and that these things are occurring um, in the neighborhood. Well, thank you for sharing that. I guess a uh, couple of questions I might have is, um, uh, has the church tried to uh, um, engage the community in some kind of uh, uh, outreach? Uh, this is happening in a, in, in, the Glen Burnie community, you would think that business leaders, uh, religious, other religious organizations would rally to your uh, side. And um, as was done uh, when the church was desecrated in Odenton, um, mm -hmm. it come out in support of not having this occur. And I, I, I don't know. Um, I'm not familiar with the church in Odenton. I would ask, is it a church that is active and has a community that uses the building every day? Yes, yes, it is. That's, so our, that's ours a is a little right. Ours is a little bit different. The community around it. So some of the neighbors within the neighborhood are part of our church community, even though they now worship on B and A Boulevard. So the community, the neighbors are very active. They are always there. Someone, I think the community association president and somebody within one of the neighbors always comes up and, you know, talks to our maintenance man and says, this is horrible that this is going on. And I hear things. I, I, you know, I can hear them getting into the building. Most recently, they started to take a drill and drill out the bolts that have the um, plywood on the windows and then they take the plywood down and they're smashing the windows so this is just a relentless thing for an abandoned building um, we have not sought uh, to have uh, a lot of attention brought to it because right now there's such a small circle of people that know about what's going on inside that we didn't think that it would bear good fruit to advertise that we thought we thought it would add more fuel to an unwanted um you know we don't want to bring attention to this and we think that if we were to bring it out more in the open it would bring a lot more attention to the acts of of these criminals and give them more attention than we want to give them um we do think that this is more vandalism than hate crimes um, because it's consistently happening. They're not, they're not consistently um, putting hate crimes or uh, racial slurs or um, 
you know, uh, homophobia kind of things on what they're doing. They're just destroying this building uh, brick by brick. Um, the police department and the archdiocese um, has seen this kind of thing before with abandoned churches, with closed down churches that are waiting. And um, we're hoping that they don't set it on fire. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing this with us. Uh, any questions from other commissioners? Can I ask a question? Um, yes. So uh, I know uh, I myself have having to deal with a semi-empty building, but the one thing uh, I, I did hear you say, um, um, Nancy, was that you didn't want to bring more attention to the structure and what was going on. However, uh, I think one of the first things that I learned was that uh, that neighborhood watch kind of idea might uh, be useful. And maybe you've already reached out to the neighborhood. The other was uh, we invested in some rings and I know that uh, Sam's club have some pretty good night cameras and stuff, but also we have neighbors that have their own rings mm -hmm. and they see things on their own rings, like people passing by or whatever that's out of the ordinary or very late at night. And then they, there's a community of people on the rings. And then they say, did anybody see this happen the other night? Or it was at 2 a.m. And then we get emails about things happening on the street or in the neighborhood. And then we, then we check our ring to see if it happened, you know, came by us. We, we had people putting slurs on our porch, on our steps, on our fence. So we, we kicked it up a notch. We mm -hmm. then started to walk around the neighborhood and say, this has been happening on this square block. Would you, you know, if that, you see anything weird on your ring, would you, would you share it with us? Here's our email. Mm -hmm. And these kinds of, we realized that it took a, a community to protect uh, the historic nature of our facility. So we, we went further, we got more rings. We told people in the neighborhood, especially around the block that we're at, we asked for information. We gave out our email because we didn't have the money. We couldn't do it ourselves. We didn't have 24 hour security. And again, even in the city of Annapolis, uh, they were like, yeah, okay, we're busy. We have other things to do. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering that maybe it is time to engage the community at, at a greater whole, but that's just my opinion that I wanted to, you know, share. And um, I'm sorry this is happening to you. Well, we, we certainly appreciate that. Um, we have neighbors with it that are immediately next to the building. Um, the, the building sits on a piece of property that is not close to, directly close to a lot of houses and the apartments. We own, I think there are seven acres of land that our property is on. Most of it is waterfront and wooded, and then there's woods, and then the apartments, and then there's woods, and then the other, and then the front faces Furnace Avenue with some houses like across the street and down a little bit. But unfortunately we don't have Wi-Fi in that building. So we, these are things that we have thought of, but we, we don't have Wi-Fi in the building. We can't afford to install Wi-Fi in the building. We're barely keeping the electricity on. Um, and we're going to, uh, we're meeting with some members from the County Executive's Office to bring attention to this. We've been in touch with the police Community Relations Council, and we'll get in touch with the um, and have made the Northern District Police Relations Council aware of it. Um, we have not done um, a lot to involve the community. I do agree with that 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 would be a step that we can do. Um, but we're hoping that um, we did 
secure another contract for the property. Now we're back to where we were before. It's going to be a two-year permit process to get this uh, company to take ownership of it, raise the building, and start to see um, progress in that area as opposed to just an abandoned church. Um, I guess uh, in addition to the county executive's office, have you made your uh, county council person aware of this issue? I ha I have not reached out. As a matter of fact, we had not. We had only reached out to the police department to do uh, to report the crimes. It was your office that reached out to us, and it was the county executive's office that reached out to us. So I can definitely reach out to um, to our council representatives. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, any any other uh, questions or comments from uh, uh, commissioners? Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, one of the things we can do is uh, monitor and follow up with uh, HRO Smith with whatever happens with the meetings with the uh, county executive officer office. Mm -hmm. Happy to do that. Okay. And um, the reason why we asked uh, uh, Ms. Drew to come and make this presentation is to uh, highlight the kinds of uh, uh, disgraceful and sometimes hurtful and oftentimes always hurtful uh, activities that occur um, uh, in Anne Arundel County that we, ha I think, have some responsibility to uh, at least to offer uh, a helping hand in whatever way we can in uh, helping to uh, uh, make things better. And uh, again, uh, uh, really uh, um, echo uh, Commissioner Michaels, and I think all of us when we say I'm uh, really sorry for your uh, uh, problem, continuing problems with this issue. Well, we appreciate the concern, and we really do want the commission to know that we are doing everything we can to get this property to no longer be identified as a church, but to be identified as a, um, a, a new housing development or whatever it's going to be when the new purchaser receives it so that it can bring growth back into that community it's a nice quiet community um and it generally has not seen this type of activity as far as i'm concerned as far as i know great um and uh hopefully uh, uh there'll be something that maybe can expedite the the permitting process a little bit although i'm not a I'm not on that committee. I'm not a county commissioner. Definitely not the county executive. That's something for the politicians to decide. That That is for sure. That is for sure. Well, thank you all so much for having me. Um, Mr. Peterson, I appreciate you reaching out to us and inviting us into this conversation. Well, thank you for uh, coming and sharing the information. Um, and uh, again, we're so sorry for what's happening to you, thank your you. community, and Please. the community. This is Commissioner Dijoni. I would like to pursue one item. Um, in the face of what I would call bad behavior, and that's putting it mildly, um, all over the place, um, what I'm noticing is when people decide to become hostile towards others, they frequently throw racism, sexism, other forms of prejudice onto the, onto the pile as part of the generalized attack. And I'm not sure we can do anything to make people behave better. I know we can't. I can hardly make myself behave better. But I think we need to remain a tune that is cascading into open assault um, on property of and persons of color, non-neurotypical configuration, um, gender, um, anything other than straight um, cisgender uh, identity, um, racial differences. Um, 
I don't want you to lose the fact that this is a can't cheat, a, an opportunity to call a hate crime what it is. It's criminal vandalism with a hate component. I heard you in a most Christian manner, I believe, saying, well, it's not always there. It's a truthful statement, and it, that doesn't seem to main, be the main focus. But I'm saying we have to recognize that it's part of the configuration and ask you to continue to pursue that. Sure. And and our pastor, even though he's not here today, uh, was the first to say, now it's become a hate crime. You know, when they were just breaking wind, not just, but when they were doing acts of vandalism, he said, you know, these are just vandals. When they came in and wrote these horrific things on the altar, what they, even though it was decommissioned from us, it was perceived by them to be an altar. They wrote the word altar on it. Um he said, this is now a hate crime. And he's active in other Anne County um, committees that he's discussing with them as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Drew. And we appreciate uh, uh, you uh, sharing uh, this information with us. You're welcome. And thank you again for uh, inviting me. I appreciate it. You bet. All right. Bye now. Bye. Okay, um, now like I'd like to move to uh, our next uh, item on the agenda uh, and ask Commissioners Day Doney and Z uh, Goodman to uh, talk about the uh, proposed uh, AACPS policy regarding use display of flags in school buildings and what implications this has for our work as a Human Relations Commission. Um, Commissioner Peterson, you know, I've been late on this and, um, D and I planned to talk and did not talk. C, do you want to start out or do you want me to start out? And thank you for putting the link into the draft policy. If you want to start out, feel free. Great. And I want to acknowledge that, um, our participants from, um, I guess from the LGBTQ, um, plus coalition, um, Ms. McFarland and, um, Ms. Alicott are, are very knowledgeable in this area, too. So a policy was put As forward. As am I. <laughs> hey, there you are, Jane. <laughs> Commissioner Ferris as well. Policy was put forward at the request of community members by a member of the Board of Education to the policy committee to um, restrict the display of flags and flags are defined as rectangular gloss symbols with um that's the idea what well, is the wording um on on flags it's a a, a pretty broad and generalized description and it's not always cloth but policy was put forward to limit the display of flags as defined to the american flag the county flag the state flag and only those other flags that have bona fide educational purposes. Um, this is clearly part of uh, a movement that's national, but it's here in Anne Arundel County in particular. And Anne Arundel County has experienced difficulties over flags. The policy, in accordance with board um, policy, um, moved out, came out of that committee, not with a recommendation, it came out of the board policy committee to the board and began public discussion and consideration. The first public discussion was a little over two weeks ago and a number of the members of the community testified. There was, we are now drawing towards the end of a 30 day public comment period and public comment is actively solicited. Jaden, can you please get the link into the chat? Please, uh, speaking as individuals until the board makes a decision and all viewers until the board makes a decision, use this link to put in your personal input to the Board of Education as part of the generalized public discourse. Uh, the second reader will be um, about two weeks from a little less than two weeks from now. And there is profound public comment coming, a lot of public comment coming in, a lot of requests for public comment. 
The issues that are raised are, in general, the um, use of some flags as, is seen as um, creating a hostile environment. I'll, I'll use that phrase in the generic sense, not in the legal sense. A non-welcoming environment to, let's give an example, an LGBTQ plus pride flag would be seen as um, creating a non-welcoming environment to a devoutly Christian child who saw LGBTQIA identity as um, sinful. Black Lives Matter banners can be seen as terrorist threats to children whose parents regard um, the Black Lives Matter movement as a um, Marxist initiative. Um, there are many arguments for and many arguments against. They have been made. The biggest argument for that I've heard in addition to, for the policy in addition to the perceived threatening nature of some of the uh, of flags that are affirmative to other groups of students um, is that the US flag should be sufficient to cover everyone. On the other side, there are those who, and I've spoken from the NAAC perspective um, as one of those, who feel that it is very important to have representation and acknowledgement of representation and belonging to marginalized threatened communities. Harking back to what I said a while before, now everybody's throwing everything into a, a great big fire of animosity. And um, the specific threatened communities that we must typically mention are the uh, those who are not readily identifying as um, straight, cis, gendered, um, strictly binary uh, individuals, um, neuroatypical individuals, and people who are not readily identified as white individuals. There are other groups that seem to need their identity as well. I should have never said that. I believe everybody needs our identity reflected and respected. Other groups include people who've moved around the country a lot and their greatest identity might be with a branch of the military, um, with a country where they were born, a country whose culture they still practice even though they and their families, families have been immigrant residents for anything from three days to 20 years. That's the perspective I want to offer. I have stated it without passion. There is passion in the discussion. And this has touched on two things, two areas of identity that this commission has stood up to support before. Black and brown people through our, affiliate, our commitment to recognize that Black Lives Matter and the importance of people with non- strictly limited um, binary cis gender identities and practices. They've stood up for all of these members of our community. When the time comes, my recommendation is that we're going to stand up for them again. Z, may I turn it over to you? Yeah, uh, that was very, very well said. Um, I especially want to echo that a lot of not only students in the AACPS system, but also staff are immigrants. And like I've had teachers who have flags in their classrooms from countries they're from. And I think that there's a lot of stigma around immigrants in the modern political sphere. Um, but there are like I've had teachers from Canada and teachers from Latin American countries, and that's part of their identity, as well as students from various countries and that's part of their identity too and they should be feeling welcomed in the school system and having those flags in a classroom a flag from a student's country or pride flags black lives matter flags those show students in historically marginalized communities and who live in areas or attend school in areas where there's not a lot of diversity and there's a lot of prejudice and there's a history of marginalization, they can see that there is a safe space for them in their schools. They can see that they have a place where they can go to school and 
they can talk to that teacher and they can sit in that classroom and they know that they are not going to be targeted or harassed. Or if something does happen, the teacher will be an upstander and stand up for them. Um, Chairman Peterson also did ask me to discuss Krask's stance on this. Unfortunately, due to the time of year, um, Krask cannot take a formal position because of officer elections occurring and then because the school year has ended and there needs to be a formal uh, meeting for the executive team to vote on any testimony. But uh, I did speak with our secretary of legislation who directed me to um, Krask's stance on the county council bill that was back in the fall um, where they did, uh, where we did support with amendments um, with a very specific amendment uh, that said, um, allowing flags to be flown for the purpose of increasing diversity with the approval of the county building supervisor. So big emphasis on supporting the diversity and inclusion of our school systems, which flags are an important and key piece of developing those inclusive environments, which our county has already done so much work towards doing. And this would be taking a huge step backwards. Very well said. Um, I guess I'd now open this up for uh, any comments from commissioners. Um, hello. I, uh, so being a member of the LGBT community for 47 years uh, and supporting the Annapolis uh, LGBT community and being at the uh, county council meeting when there was a proposal last fall for, uh, you know, not being able to fly the pride flag, but they, they couched it, they framed it in sort of a general nature, all flags <clears throat> at the library. So we showed up in force and that uh, was, bill was immediately pulled. And then I never did hear what the follow-up on that was. But we just spent an hour on bias, behavior, and language. Uh, and I was just looking quickly at some of the comments in here where it says, creates a hostile environment, perceived characteristics. So I sort of um, am frustrated personally because I was like, have we not had this fight already? And didn't we already resolve some of these? And boy, am I happy to live in Maryland. And whenever I see a pride flag at a business or a facility, I actually feel safer. I feel like it's a safe space. But if I see a Confederate flag or a Nazi flag, well, then all of a sudden I, you know, my hair stands up because I perceive that there's going to be hate speech or a hostile environment. Now I can, this is, an old man talking about how I feel and all the 47 years plus, plus, plus that I've been through on these particular fights. Um, and most of the things that I've seen where it's Black Lives Matters, it is always based on having a safe space and increasing the circle of love around what that flag might represent. As the young lady mentioned in school, if I would see a flag from another country, I am more interested in knowing more about that. But that's just me. Maybe it, it brings uh, an ire to other people if they see a flag from Persia or Iran or Iraq or whatever. Maybe their head goes some other location. But I guess in my opinion, um, and, and uh, I didn't know that they had done this, but maybe putting some language out there that includes the amendments or supporting those conversations or commissions that say, uh, you know, flags that represent, you know, the best I can say is not a hostile environment and more of a inclusive, safe environment. I'm all for it. So that probably wasn't very helpful, but I just needed to get it off my chest. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I think I need just a little bit of understanding as to 
So we we are we are wanting or what's being presented is to open up the um, possibility of flag displays of how many or what or you know just flag displays for all to feel like they're included. Correct. Uh, correct. I think it's the other. I think it's the other way around, and I want okay. to apologize. I'd okay. ask Chairman Peterson if we could engage in this conversation and take a public stance. Okay. The policy is to do restrict the display of flags. Oh, the policy is to restrict the display. Yes. Okay. To those okay. with a bona fide educational purpose to be interpreted at the building level, which is to say by the principal. Okay. Not a uniform policy across the, um, beyond that across the county. So let me ask this kind of playing the other side here. Um, if the school is practicing um, or have in place policies and regulations for inclusion and diversity, um, if they have in place policies and re regulations against hate and bias, do you all think at some point that it becomes a little distracting if we have this um, this kind of melting pot of what can be displayed. And my other part of that I ask is if we want to, so if the practices are in place so that everyone can feel accepted and we start and we put all these, all the different displays of flags out, what about those you know, for just as an example, that worship the devil and they want a stand, you know, a flag that represents that. Or for those that, that are Christians and they want a flag. Like, at what point does it then just be like too much of a distraction? Or, yeah, too much of a distraction of trying to satisfy every one in what they they believe to be or what they practice or follow that's well, my right question now I, right now i think that the answer is being promoted by the policy is okay. to um not discomfort some groups it's its emphasis does not appear to be on inclusion and that was a big if um we're not there nobody's persecuting and shooting devil worshipers as far as i know mm -hmm. but if you're a black gay man in america you are at the highest risk of murder of any demographic trans mm -hmm. so if we are oh, if I'm we sorry, are black trans man yes a so, woman, trans woman. so the schools want to only they want to restrict and they want to show display flag of representing the united states of america and representing the state of Maryland. I'm going to um, I'm going to correct that. It isn't that the schools want. Okay. A constituent asked a member of the Board of Education to bring forward this policy. The policy was reviewed by the Policy Review Committee and uh, uh, within the Board of Education that said, "Yes, this looks like a policy. We're not going to recommend for it or against it. We're just going to give it to the Board of Education for public discussion." So okay. I think the it is more appropriate to characterize this as the Board of Education is hosting and holding discussions about whether or not flags other than the U.S. flag, the county flag, and the state flag should be allowed to be displayed under what circumstances. Okay, thank you. I think we had some clarity as to what mm -hmm. the discussion truly was about. And Z and Jaden have been very close to this, and I don't know if we're going to hear from other the guests tonight. Um, so I don't want to be the author, the only voice commenting on this. Mary, we we enjoy hearing your voice, though. You, we we really do truly. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we respect what you say, Commissioner Daydoni. Thank you, my friend, Commissioner Hatcher. Um, I think, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. 
Well, I, I was just going to say, I think if the, the question is whether we take a position on this as a commission, um, I, will, I was particularly um, persuaded and impressed by Z's discussion. And I, I think that what's really important is that the emphasis is on flags that promote inclusion. And um, there are some flags that we know promote the opposite of inclusion, and those would not be included in those that could be flown. Um, but those that do promote inclusion, I, I, I think that's the key um, to why we should, in my view, take a position that restricting flying flags that promote inclusion um, should not occur in our county. I think it would be a huge step backwards. And I think that it would um, would not be a good position for our, our school system to take. And I think that we, we are in a position to speak out and I think that we should. So there's, there's my, my position on it um, okay. as a member. Thank you. Anybody else? I do just want to draw attention to what Jaden said in the chat. Some there are already flags that are deemed hate symbols, such as the Confederate flag. So that's already a prohibited flag. And I guess the the uh, the question for us is: We just had a earlier discussion about unity, inclusiveness, unity days, and so if you leave this to the building principle is going to be kind of disjointed throughout the county how this expression occurs with some got with some schools saying no the only thing we're going to do is have the county flag the american flag and the maryland flag and other other uh, uh schools perhaps uh, allowing other uh, expressions of inclusion so i think uh, there are some flags that are mandatory to be flown for example it's required that the us flag be Talk, uh, posted or, or displayed in every yes. instructional space. And the, those three flags are mandatory on the flagpoles out front. And right. this discussion isn't about the flagpoles out front. No. This discussion is largely about banners flown during um, Pride Week. It's about a Black Lives Matter flag, such as Jaden has in the background in his room, being posted in some teachers' rooms or a, a pride flag, especially a diversity pride, wide pride flag being in the room where the um, gay, uh, GSA meets. Um, in reality, that's what this is about. Um, yeah. Are you going to take um, any comments from the audience, um, Chairman Peterson? I noticed that um, um, Abby Alicott had had her hand up for a while, and I don't know if you're going to take any comments from the audience or not. Uh, Chanel, can we uh, put uh, Ms. Ellicott in? Is she in? Hi. She's in. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for taking my comment. So I am a, the facilitator for the Coalition for LGBTQ Plus Students. Um, I'm also speaking as a mother and a psychologist. Our really big concern about this flag policy is that it, if passed, it could be used to, and we believe it would be used, to prevent um, flags such as the pride flag, pride progress flag, from being in school spaces currently um, there's a whole organization called GLSEN that does work on promoting a welcoming environment and a safe environment for students in schools. This is a national or international organization. They have a whole project that our schools um, have been using, at least some of our schools, where safe spaces are designated for 
youth in the LGBTQIA um, community, and some of that includes Pride Flag. So right now, some classrooms, some teachers, some administrators choose to have Pride Flags displayed in some fashion. It might be a small flag on a desk, might not be a gigantic flag in their room. And so if this policy is passed, that goes away. That visual representation of safety is gone, as one of the commissioners talked about. And we're really concerned about this. It's taking something away that's already in place. Um, and I certainly believe there's a big agenda and motivation for that, which I won't speak about here. Currently, if a flag is seen as disruptive to a school environment to get to um, one of the commissioner's concerns or distracting, my understanding is that the administration of the school can look into that matter and presumably do something about it. And so I don't think we have a problem here. I think this is an effort to get rid of certain representations for different communities in our school. Um, as Jaden pointed out, there are a number of flags with hate speech, alcohol, weapons, depicting those symbols. Those are not allowed in schools. And so if by some stretch of an imagination, there are so many different flags being put up in a school that it's deemed a distraction, I think we should trust our administrators to deal with that. And if they need help, they can go to their district superintendents. So this is taking something away that's been a part of our school environments. And in my opinion, extremely important in our school environments. And I'll stop for here for now. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, um, is there any further uh, discussion statements commissioners want to make? Um, at this point in time, um, as chair, I would entertain understanding the the our discussion and all of its information. If anyone wants to uh, propose a uh, motion that we uh, develop a statement and have that presented. Um, and I guess it would be presented at the next school board meeting in July. Um, June 26th. Pardon? June 26th? Yes. Okay. It could be presented as if it's submitted in time, which is um, only a few days from now. It could be submitted as written testimony and you can apply to for oral testimony. There will be a, or either in person or video. There will be so many people applying that there's no guarantee that a speaker from the Human Relations Commission would be selected. So I would suggest that the motion address both submitting testimony, written testimony, yes, of signing up for spoken testimony, and submitting the HRC's position into the um, public collection of uh, discussion right now right, around the policy. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? I'd second it. Okay, that's... Uh, what was the matter? motion exactly? <laughs> I, I, I think, Eugene, I, I think our president, President Peterson took my uh, suggestion for the motion as a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Therefore, therefore, I move the Human Relations Commission prepare a, a position statement um, on the flag policy and that we submit that both as part of the public collection of comments during this 30-day period and as um, written testimony for the next board meeting along with a... Um, a request to provide oral testimony and Chairman Peterson will select um, either himself or someone from commission to deliver that oral testimony if we're selected for oral testimony. And Second, I don't know if we should include that our position is to oppose because we just said to deliver testimony. 
So I move um, a friendly amendment that a position is opposed. Oh, the friendly amendment is accepted. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All for your um, consent. Pardon? Um, I made a call for unanimous consent, so we don't have to vote. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, you can make the call for unanimous consent. Chairman Peterson has to. That's correct. Otherwise, but, we have to vote on the amendment. Um, because we've had discussion back and forth, I would prefer to uh, have a vote on the amendment. So, um, uh, it was a friendly amendment. You don't have to vote on that friendly amendment if the um, proposer accepts it per oh. round of order. Yeah, I think you're right. You're correct. Okay, so um like to have a vote on the motion as uh, made and amended. Um, and Madam Secretary, could you call the roll? Um, you have to excuse me. I I am totally lost in this process right now. So am I calling the roll for everyone to confirm? Was that what's because normally we just say I. So I'm confused in the process. Well, <clears throat> we, we could we could do that. But I think this is an important uh, issue. So I want everybody's uh, vote recorded. If that's OK. Otherwise, we could do it by unanimous consent. Okay, let me just get everyone's names back up again. Okay. Um, so, Chairman Peterson, what's your vote? Uh, four. Yay. Um, Commissioner David, I believe it was. Is it Commissioner yes. David? David Michaels, yes. David Michaels, sorry about that, sir. Uh, four, yes. Um, Commissioner Gaskin. Four. Commissioner Goodman. Four. Commissioner Ferris. Or oh, Forrest. My apologies. Ferris, Ferris okay. Aye. Lisa Sorrow. Aye. Four. Commissioner Daydoni. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Tosin. Aye, four. Commissioner McFarland? No? I'm not on the commission. <laughs> Sorry. We got some new folks here, so my apologies. Um, Do you want to take your own vote? Um, Commissioner Hatcher, I'm a nay, because I, I need more information. And I feel like I'm missing someone. Am I missing someone? Commissioner Clemens? Oh, no, I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry. I think we have all three of the new commissioners, right? Denton. Commissioner Denton. Um, Commissioner present, Denton. But she um, is not present no longer. Okay. That's right. Okay. Thank you, um, Chanel. Chairman Peterson, we have, we have received all votes. So it looks like it's a four by the number of votes. You're on mute, sir. So the vote was eight to one. Eight to one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Um, and now I'd like to move to uh, Human Relations Officer uh, Smith's report. Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you. Um, this has been a very robust and lively meeting. I'm not going to um, prolong my report <laughs> this evening. Um, bear with me just one second. I'm pulling up some stats here really quickly. There we are. Okay. So the uh, big thing that happened in the county executive's office this week, you might've heard, budget passed. 
Um, and so that was the culmination of um, quite a bit of work, um, quite a bit of effort. We're really excited that the budget has passed. There's lots of great stuff in it. Um, the, you know, the motto for the budget project this year was funding our future. Um, and the budget has uh, just so many amazing items. There's an entire website do devoted to it. There's a tool that you can use to see what was funded. Um, so you're strongly encouraged to um, take a look at it if you have it, just to see, you know, they say that you can see what um, someone values or what a country values based on where they put their money and you'll get um, a really strong idea about what this administration views as a priority. And so um, we're really, really happy about that. Um, there is, we requested some funding for the commission as part of the budget process. Um, <laughs> I think this might be the first time the commission has ever gotten any money, um, but I, I, I have to double check. I'm gonna talk to our budget analyst and just make sure that it survived the process. Um, so there may be some, an update on that within a month. By the time we get together again, you'll hear back. Um, I just want to give the report now on hate bias incidents uh, and where we were in the month of May. Um, so in the month of May, there were 28 um, hate bias incidents reported to the police. Again, we remember that these are not all um, assessed to be hate crimes. There is a distinction. We've talked about this previously, but I like to give that reminder. 19 of the May incidents were race-based. One was race and sex. Um, two were characterized as racial, as distinguished from race. I'm not sure about that difference. And uh, six were characterized as sexual orientation-based. Um, for the year, we are at 85 such reports. Um, Unfortunately, Glenn Burney continues to have the highest number of incidents, followed by Odenton, Brooklyn, and then Annapolis. And of course, there are other jurisdictions that have had um, that have had incidents. Those are the highest number of incidents. And so that's where we that's where we're tracking. We should have our dashboard um, updated. Uh, at the end of June. Once the June stats are in, the public facing dashboard about hate bias incidents will be updated. And that's all I have for this evening. Okay. And, and we have access to that dashboard, correct? Yes. It's public facing and it's uh, via Arundel stat. Okay. Could you make sure all, all commissioners had the link to that? Yes. Happy to do it. Thank you. Um, at this point in time, since we're running, we're running late. I'd like to uh, go quickly through the rest of the agenda. Um, we don't have any old business, the new business. Um, I will send out an email, but we are going to have a July hybrid meeting. And that means that we'll be all face to face and then we'll be able to uh, uh, transmit it out to, to the public. And um, at that meeting, we'll also discuss whether they have the August meeting as a hybrid meeting. Um, at this point, I'd like to, uh, uh, say that, um, our next monthly meeting on, will be Thursday, July the 20th, 2023. Uh, it'll be a hybrid meeting. It'll start at 6 PM. And now I'd like to, uh, move for adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, before we adjourn, Chairman Peterson, I just want to let you know that we did have we did not have anything to report for the oh, um, right. Annapolis um, human relations. They right. they had to cancel. All so right. um, just wanted to put that out there as well. No, thank you, and I, I apologize for skipping over that, Madam Secretary. Um, move, move to adjourn. Okay, that was uh, uh, Commissioner Dejoni. Commissioner Dejoni, is there a second? A second. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Hearing none, it's a non-debatable motion. Thank you all and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Nice to meet you all. Same here. Bye.